Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Um, this is a lot busier than I was expecting. First of all, I just want to say, obviously, uh, this is the first fully charged show. Um, I did not have a hand really in organizing it. That was Dan, the man that just ran off stage. So Dan, thank you for putting all this effort in. Thank you for everyone who's uh, come here to trade and thank you everyone for buying a ticket and being interested. But um, we're here to do uh, a chat called an introduction to electric vehicles. So really this is a chat about maybe encouraging people who don't have an electric car to consider it or people that already have one, what um, got them into it or not. And I've got three helpers and I'd like to introduce them to you. We have Tom Callow here from Charge Master. We have Jordan Brompton here from My Energy, who they're best known for their Zappy device. They're trading over in the Hall 1 there. Charge Master's trading behind us, behind this big screen. And at the end there, we have Jonathan Porterfield from Eco Cars. You sell Eco Cars to people. That's what he does. Okay, so please give them a warm welcome. I think the first, the first question I was going to have is obviously an intro to electric cars was, how did you guys get into electric cars in the first place? Because some people came at this by, they got a lift in someone's weird car, if they were considered weird at some point, and you had to be a bit special to want to own one. Go on then, you, you start, Jordan. How did you get into electric cars? <laughs> well, um, we come from a renewable background and we manufactured um, energy smart devices that divert power to hot water. And we was getting asked the question a lot, like, why can't you just divert the power to the car battery? And, um, you know, our... our um, company owner at the time had a leaf and he found it increasingly frustrating not being able to harness the energy um, straight into from the solar straight to um, his car battery he was just exporting to the grid all the time so um, he thought there must be an easier way to manage it so we got about developing it and um, that's sort of I was sort of flung into this new world and uh, <laughs> it's not new I know well it was it two years ago to me it started in 1901 or something <laughs> yeah. for me it was new and um, my first trip in an EV was up to Orkney to meet Robert um, and I was in a really early Nissan Leaf going from Cleethorpes to Orkney I was terrified but I made it <laughs> and um, I've not looked back ever since I now own an EV so um, yeah that's Renewables is what got me into EVs, yeah. How about you, Tom? So uh, when I was at school, uh, I uh, didn't want to do a science subject. I didn't do A-levels, I did something called the International Baccalaureate. Had to do a science subject, and I uh, found out that I could do DT, and I was like, yes, I have to wear lab coats. DT. Science lab, so I did DT. And uh, in my course, I had to write a long essay about something in, that I was interested in, something I could go and do a research project on. And I said, I love cars. What can I do a research project on in cars? I said, well, it has to be quite innovative, it has to be quite different, you know, you can't just write about, you know, car design, it has to be about engineering. I said, okay, there's all this new wacky stuff coming, so I'm going to do a, a research project on hydrogen cars and whether hydrogen cars will ever work. They won't. Um, so, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, can't but, play um, around with hydrogen at school yeah. or college. So, uh, anyway, you? I wrote about hydrogen, got interested in that, realised that hydrogen cars were probably a long way away, got interested in EVs instead because they were much more in, in sort of uh, in tune. So, um, I've been, yeah, interested in them for probably about 15 years now. And um, I drive one, I do 30,000 electric miles a year. Um, I'm pleading for an iPace as my next one. We'll see. 30,000 miles a year? Yeah. That's electric, a lot. Yeah. And they're small batteries, aren't they? 30 kilowatt hour, 40 kilowatt hour batteries. Um, and we've got, you know, I always say to people, you know, don't be scared about doing high mileages in EVs. They're a great, great tool for doing high mileages. Um, we've got two cars now stand behind me. Um, one is a BMW i8, and before some of you scream and go, it's not an electric car, um, I can get at least 60 mpg out of that on a 40 mile commute. It's much better than a Porsche 911 in that sense. And we've actually got a Tesla on our stand as well, Model X, that's done 41,000 miles in one year, and the i8's done 86,000 miles in three years. So they're high mileage cars, they get used, and I always say to people, don't look at EVs as, as short mileage cars. Actually, to your point about the i8 being not an electric car, that's the first thing we'll talk about once Jonathan's told me how he got into electric cars. Because this man travels more miles in EVs than I know. I don't know anyone, maybe someone in this room will travel more miles in a year than this man, but it's borderline ridiculous. <laughs> um, in 2004, I was already called Eco Cars, and I was selling hybrid and LPG, liquid petroleum gas vehicles. Yeah. Uh, so that was quite successful. And then in 2011, I went to a big EV show at Battersea in London, and had a go in an innocent leaf, and came home and said to my wife, I've just driven the future, it's definitely going to go electric. So I took it so seriously, I sold my midlife crisis car, which was a Lotus Elise, 
and my wife had a roadster smart uh, a smart roadster. Smart, I love a smart we roadster. We sold yeah. those two to buy my first Nissan Leaf at £23,000. My mates thought I was bonkers, but I wanted to be the first used car dealer selling EVs. I, I love going past the petrol stations and just thinking, I'm never going to use that again. Yeah, it's just fun. the best feeling, especially when you've charged on green energy as well, because then there's just, there's no argument. It's definitely in the winter with the whole warming up a, a diesel or petrol engine and the, the ability to be able to pre-war, pre, pre, pre-warm a car. And it's, it is yeah. more convenient. I think my experience is if people have plug-in hybrids, it's like a stepping stone to a proper EV. Yeah. So they've still got, it gets over that initial range anxiety. So a lot of my customers have had a tax lander or a Mitsubishi Outlander, yeah. and then they get it and they realise... They, they rarely use the petrol engine, so they then go to a full EV. So I think plug-in hybrids have got their place. Until the range gets bigger, I think they are a useful stepping stone. I think particularly where you've got a plug-in hybrid of the range of, let's say, sort of, you know, the average, the average daily dri- driven distance in the UK is 26 miles. So if you've particularly got, you know, plug-in hybrids that can genuinely do, you know, 40, 50 miles of range, what it makes people think is, I could actually do 90% of my journeys yeah. on electric in this car, so imagine what I could do in a full EV. That's what I think it makes people think. Um, and for me, it's all about changing perceptions as well. So, you know, if people that haven't ever seen an i8 before and think EVs are look like, you know, gee whiz, if they see an i8, at least they sort of have a view of what's coming. And, you know, as I say, I mean, I'd love a pure electric i8 far more than a, a plug-in hybrid one. Um, but we think that's coming quicker than most people think. So I think plug-in hybrids will be a short bridge for maybe the next sort of five to ten years. And I think after that, you'll see actually full EVs being the mass market model. So... You know, there's 100 new models coming in the next three years from different manufacturers, and most of them are full EV. Yeah, well, you're seeing a huge amount of investment, obviously, if you watch Fully Charged, which I presume some of you do. Um, most big car manufacturers are investing massively in, um, in, in, in full EV. Um, so, nevertheless, you're going to get a lot more models coming in the future, and a, a, a wider breadth, probably, because at the moment, it, most of it's at the upper end of luxury and expense, and, and that will become uh, at the lower end as well, I hope. Yeah, and just a quick point on design as well. So um, Ian Callum on the iPace launch last weekend was saying to me, you know, actually from a car designer's point of view, a plug-in hybrid is quite compromised because if you're a car designer, you want simplicity and you know to package things in certain places. So you've got you know Ian Callum, you know the sort of greatest car designer in the UK, saying actually he'd far rather now be designing pure EVs because he can shove batteries in interesting places and make the car designs completely different. So yeah. I think as long as those guys are nudging their engineering teams, we'll be fine. Yeah, I was going to say, ironically, we're probably due to have a more stylish car future because of the way you can package EVs. And like you say, plug-ins, it's effectively got two engines, so that's more complicated. But I've got, before you say something, I'm just going to ask the audience, I'm, I'm intrigued to know, put your hands up if you're on your first electric car. Okay, put, uh, put your hands up if you've got a plug-in vehicle of some sort. Put your hands up if you, you're on your second EV. Okay, interesting statistics. Who hasn't got an EV? Yeah. Who hasn't got any kind of plug-in car at all? Ooh. Wow. Can we do that? Can we do that again? Can Isn't we just, that can great? Can you just raise that your that hand? Is. I want a picture of that. Everyone who hasn't got okay, a plug-in car. Okay, can you just do that again yeah. for Tom's phone? That's incredible. This is fantastic. See, this is really interesting because I didn't think that, 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 that the majority of people watching this would be people that haven't gone into it. I was thinking the take-up for... EVs for most people is their range anxiety. So I, I often hear people say, well, when I can get a genuine 100 miles out of an EV, I'll buy one. And now what I'm hearing is, now, but when it's a genuine 200 miles, I'll buy one. I can almost guarantee if the average range is 200, people will say, ah, but when it's 300 miles, I'll get one. So it's this whole perception of range anxiety which is one of the reasons I do crazy trips from Leicester, where I'm originally from, moved to Orkney five years ago. I've now driven from Leicestershire to Orkney 41 times. Did you hear that? He's driven from Leicester to Orkney 41 times. This man doesn't bat an eyelid. That puts my one trip to shame. (laughs) I was so proud of it. puts pretty much all my (laughs) trips to shame. And I've done it in a variety. So I've done it from the humble Mitsubishi i-Neve, which is also a Peugeot Iron or a Citroen C0, as well as the Leaf, the ENV, a Tesla Model S, which was just amazing. But with planning, you can do long trips. It is one of the make-or-break situations with 
electric car ownership. I think, first and foremost, you really have to be able to charge at home. I consider my home to be my fuel station. And if you can get that into your head, uh, and into your head that your, your home fuel station doesn't sell cans of Monster or cigarettes, when you get home, much like your phone, you, you go in, you plug it in, and you leave it. And you either set the timer, which I do personally, I, I set my timer so that it comes on at one in the morning and it's ready by half five in the morning. Yeah. And that's where, that's you, you, you're a good starting point, I yeah, think. Yeah, there's so much flexibility now. You can charge on cheaper tariffs. You can charge from the solar. You can charge at specific times. You can load balance the home so you're not going to blow main fuses. So it'll just, you know, charging technology is out there. It, it's becoming, re it's relatively cheap now. There's still grants available. So it's like, yeah, it is your fuel station. I only charge at home. And then you've got Tom here, obviously, Charge Master. Rem just remind people what Charge Master is briefly, Tom. Yeah, so we, I mean, we do two core things. We're a UK business, uh, we do two core things. We make charging points, so we make everything from a three kilowatt wall box right up to a 50 kilowatt DC rapid charger in the UK. Um, any of you are very welcome to come and see our production facility, not all at once. Um, and uh, we're going to all 150. At once. Um, and we also operate a public charging network. So we operate the Polar Network. Um, we also operate um, within that the Charge Your Car Network and also Charge Place Scotland currently for the Scottish Government. Um, and I think what we've seen as a business is huge growth in just in general interest. Um, but in terms of charging, it's what, what, what I always say to people is there's so much diversity in charging in that you know, cars are parked and you know, people like Ian Callum have spent all their time designing these things. We park them for 95% of their lives. You know, they're just sat there doing absolutely nothing. So the idea that there's not enough time to charge cars is laughable. So the good thing is pretty much anywhere where a car is parked, most it could probably be charged. Um, and obviously the one thing that some of you in the room will be thinking is obviously people that park on the street. That's probably the most challenging area. Um, but the good thing about people who park on the street is their cars typically go elsewhere. So yes, there will be some on-street charging solutions, and there already are, obviously. But yeah, you'll be able to charge at work, and you'll potentially be able to drive home and go to work and never need to charge at the, at the sort of home area ever, for example. You'll get public rapid charging in urban areas, so urban charging hubs, which are going to be the petrol station model. So I think you'll get this sort of diversified mix of charging types. It's not a case, I think everyone sort of thinks, well, everyone who parks on the street is going to have sort of 100, a line of 100 charging points down every road in Islington. It's just not going to, you're just not going to need it. Yeah. Um, the maintenance of electric cars, you can probably explain that in more detail, John, but the ma because there's fewer moving parts, uh, much lower maintenance on an EV. Yes, so basically we've, um, you take it in for a service, and it's very similar to an MOT. So the mechanic will check the brakes, You've got regen braking, so we hear of taxi companies with over 100,000 miles on the original set of brake pads. They'll change the pollen filter, which makes the car smell nice. They'll give you some screen wash. Love a nice smelling car. Screen wash is important. Screen wash is very important, yes. And every two years, replace the brake fluid, which you should do on every car anyway. That's it. Yeah. There's nothing else to so do. So it's, it's visual checks, visual safety checks. Yeah. And they'll obviously plug it into a, a laptop which will tell you if the batteries are behaving themselves or not. I think most incentive for my customers is they want to save money. The, 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 the environmental benefit is a feel-good factor. So it, it's, it's very much cash-driven. But my, a lot of my customers on Orkney have got their own wind turbines. On average, they're five kilowatts. I really want my own then, wind turbine. They're filling up. They've got their own fuel in their back garden. Yeah. And it's costing them nothing. At any time. And if they're on a... <laughs> They're on one of the early feeding tariffs. The more electricity they use, the more they get paid. So they actually get paid to drive further by the government feeding tariff. For me, it's really important that the core reason we're all doing this is to reduce, you know, reduce pollution and is environmental. Exactly. For me, the, the, the financial thing is a kickback. Like the financial benefit is great. But for me, the only reason we're all doing this is environmental because you know, we're, we're screwed if we don't. It's so also inevitable. Well done. It's, it's inevitable. <laughs> Used EVs are probably the most green car out there because you haven't, you haven't paid to have it produced in the first place. You're buying it off somebody else. And it's, it's already a zero tailpipe emission car. And, and I guess if you want to be ultra, ultra uh, keen, it's when if you, if you can produce your own energy as well, that's a triple whammy of uh, eco smugness, is it? So people with solar panels generally think, I'm going to go electric now because they know that they've got that energy spare and they're generally that like-minded sort of person. 
And I say anybody that wants to drive an EV, just go for it. Don't, I, I wouldn't even go for a plug-in. I would go full EV. Throw yourself in at the deep end because the community of EV drivers is so nice as well. Like, I really wanted to get that across because I was literally terrified when I first went on that journey. I didn't, know, didn't really know anybody in the industry. didn't know uh, how to use a charger. I'd never plugged into a pu public charger. I was petrified. And I got so much help and support on the way. I actually got to one charge point and it was completely broke and I put a tweet out and some guy drove half an hour and swiped his card because I didn't have a card and said, there you go. Like the, t the community of EV drivers is what I'm like super passionate about. So the fact that it's helping the future, helping, I haven't got children yet and I, I'm thinking about that sort of thing for my kids. That's a big decision for me. I don't want to bring them into a world that, that's yeah. like this at the moment. So, you know, it's the way it's going. The sort of transition to you know, electric cars makes people think more about energy. It makes more people think about what they're using and what they're, you know, what they're not using. Um, and actually, you know, as, as I was saying, I think when you choose, what to, when you choose whether you're going to you know, generate your own energy or whatever, however you do it, at the end of the day, we're all on this kind of initial pioneering journey. So I think all of us want like, you know, the charging infrastructure and everything else to be where it needs to be in, let's say, 20 years, but they want it tomorrow. And I get that. But I think you know, we're 150,000 EVs out of 32 million cars. So, you know, we are like those pioneers of the petrol car when horses were going off the road, having to cobble their way across the UK, finding petrol stations, which were nowhere because petrol was totally new. So we are that community now of, of finding out. But just imagine how, how much easier this is all going to be in 5, 10, 20 years' time. We're going to have to wrap this up, I'm afraid. I really appreciate all your attention. There's uh, several more of these kind of seminars happening today, but go and talk to people. And for goodness sake, put yourself uh, a driver in, a in an electric car. John, uh, Johnny, can we just thank you to the, sorry, can we just sorry. quickly thank obviously uh, people can see you on the stage here. Can we just give a huge round of applause to all of the back of house team that you can't actually see? So Dan, Joe, Sophie, all those guys have helped organise all this. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thanks to Robert Llewellyn. Do you Woo. see a really confused man wandering around <laughs> with high vis jacket on? It's probably the man that started all of this.